This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. From the American Society for Microbiology, this is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 150, recorded on April 13th, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, a podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today, from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hi there. 150, huh? Seems like yesterday. It does. 150 episodes. Yeah. Wow. It's, that's some number, right? It's a <laughs> milestone. Sesquicentennial. Sesquicentennial. Okay. Well, yeah. I'll take it. Any kind of interesting number like that is good. 150. We do about, let's see. We do about, about 25 a year. 25 a year. That's right. So that's quite a few years, right? Yep. Four, five, six years. Well. How about that? Congratulations. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How is everything in Ann Arbor? Is it just peachy? Blooming, right? Yeah, our our um forsythia are out nice. and our yeah, other spring flowers. We've been able to play golf. Daffodils. Uh not yet. Okay. Soon. Yeah, I mean, people are golfing. I've just been um otherwise occupied. You might stay occupied for the next few years, you know. You never know. Because you have a lot of things <laughs> on your it's plate. It's all stuff I've said yes to. That's yes, what that's I keep right. reminding myself. <laughs> also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How have you been, Michael? I've been well. I'm I'm getting over one of your friends, a virus that has been annoying me for the last week, but everybody around campus seems to be sneezing and coughing and you know it's your standard spring upper respiratory yes it happens and viruses mostly are to blame that's for sure uh it keeps us um busy for sure we have a special guest today coming from the mayo clinic where she is director of the infectious diseases research laboratory she's chair of the division of clinical microbiology and also director of its bacteriology Laboratory Robin Patel, welcome to TWIM. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to join you today. Coming from Rochester, right? Yes, Rochester, Minnesota. Is that about an hour outside of uh, Minneapolis? Yeah, we're a little over an hour south of Minneapolis-St. Paul. Well, you're here because it so happens that starting on April 23rd, it will be National Medical Laboratory Professionals Week fondly known as M N M L P W. You can't you can't pronounce it unfortunately. And this event is a celebration of all the medical laboratory professionals and pathologists who play a vital role in every aspect of healthcare. So this was Michael Schmidt's idea <laughs> to um recognize this week and bring someone in that's uh, involved and you clearly are because you're director of the bacteriology laboratory and you have your own research laboratory as well. So We'll chat all about that. Um, I would like to start by finding out, Robin, a little bit about your training. Where are you from originally? So I grew up in Canada, in Montreal, Quebec. Do you speak French? Uh, I do speak French, although hopefully we're not going to conduct this in, in French. Um, wouldn't really want to do that. But yes, I do. <laughs> we could uh, have... You in French and Alio in Italian. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I grew up in Canada and um, went to high school there and then actually came down to the U.S. to go to college. Where was went that? Princeton University in New Jersey for oh, my wow. undergraduate Not too degree. far from me. Yeah, right. And then did I you, went. Can I ask you, did you have Lynn Enquist for anything? I did not. I did not. Okay. Yeah, have to, have to ask. I, I, let me run some names by it because I got lots of friends there. Lynn Anquist, Tom Shank. Yes, and I know them both very well now. Yeah, uh, but I didn't, didn't know have them at the time. time. Correct. So Tom Sohavi. Tom Sohavi. Yeah, you have yeah. got to fill in the bacteriology. Yeah. How yeah, about? Same um, thing. But Bonnie I wasn't Basler. studying microbiology back then. What did you major in? I majored in chemistry. 
Not a bad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good major for a microbiologist. <laughs> yeah. sure, it sure is, yeah. So then I went back to Canada, to McGill University mm -hmm. um, in Montreal, to mm -hmm. go to medical school. And after medical school, I came to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And mm -hmm. as you note, know, that's where I'm from now, uh, to do uh, my postgraduate training. And that um, was a, a lengthy process. I uh, completed a residency in internal medicine. And then I went on to do a three-year fellowship in infectious diseases that included both clinical practice and research. I had always wow. been doing research, even during internal medicine. And then I did another fellowship in clinical microbiology. And that all of this was at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And then I was headed back to Canada, except that I never did. I ended up staying here. And I've been here since, wow. since 19. 89. Maybe I shouldn't say that. But anyway, now you know. That's okay. Some of us have been around longer. <laughs> <laughs> but how far back do you remember wanting to uh, go to medical school? Oh, goodness. Um, in grade school, wow. I knew I wanted to go to medical school. I know. it. I know. That sounds a little crazy, did, but it, did, it just I, is the way it was. Did, was there any reason for that? Did you have someone in your family or? TV show. TV show, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no one in my family was a physician, mm -hmm. but it was something that I just knew I always wanted to do. Right. Well, you did it. Yeah. So. <laughs> and, and, and then some. And Princeton was a was a good place to, to do your undergrad. Great school. It course. was an awesome place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess you, I, I guess you liked I really it a lot. Enjoyed right? my yeah. time there. Yes, absolutely. So now you um, have multiple titles there. At, yes. Uh, at the Mayo, and one of them is you have your own laboratory that does research, and we'll. We'll talk a little bit about that today, uh, but you're also uh, chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology and director of the Bacteriology Laboratory. So maybe you yes. could fill us in on, on what you do in those positions. Absolutely. So um, the Division of Clinical Microbiology here at Mayo Clinic um, has about 280 members. Um, oh, I think... We may be the largest academic clinical microbiology group there is in the world, but there is no, you know, scoring system. So if <laughs> anyone else out there, um, you know, wants to talk about that, I'd be interested to know. We're a very big group, and I can talk a little bit about why why we're so big. Um, I uh, oversee the particular area of bacteriology along with Dr. Audrey Schutz, who actually joined us from New York. You may know mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, seven doctoral level laboratory directors that oversee the different areas, including virology, parasitology, bacteriology, mycology and mycobacteriology, hepatitis, HIV, and infectious diseases, serology. Mm -hmm. And so collectively, we oversee 271 allied health mm -hmm. staff members who uh, work with us. And we perform uh, a little over 3 million tests a year. Wow. Many wow. of which <laughs> are developed right here in our laboratories by a very expert uh, team of development technologists. And I can get into some of that later on, but it's uh, it's an amazing group to work with. I'm the chair. Mayo Clinic has a tradition of rotating leadership, uh, so I won't be the chair forever, uh, but I've been honored to be the chair for probably the last seven or so, I've lost count, uh, years of this uh, truly remarkable group. Wow. So these three million, you said three million tests a year, right? Correct. They Are they mainly from the clinic or do you, do you draw from all of Minnesota? So that's actually a, a really interesting question. Uh, traditionally, our lab, which has been open since 1911, uh, performed testing for patients who came to Mayo Clinic. And as you may or may not know, patients come from all over the world to mm. Mayo Clinic to get their health care. Uh, and so we grew up with that kind of testing. But today, we not only perform that testing, but people can send us specimens for testing from anywhere in the world. Mm. So we actually do testing for people across the United States, not just in Minnesota, but also in other countries, mm. which makes our practice really exciting. Mm. Are these specialized tests that can be done locally? Typically, yes, that's the case, yes. Mm. 
And you de- you said you also develop assays. Yes. And when you do that, do you share them with, with other laboratories? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the methods we use and develop are typically described in our publications. Mm-hmm. And um, so other uh, laboratories can perform them if if they you know follow our methods or similar methods right. to do them but you know a lot of smaller uh, diagnostic labs don't have the ability to develop their own tests right. and it probably wouldn't be very efficient for them to develop highly esoteric tests that wouldn't be regularly performed in any yeah. case so yeah. a lot of the testing that we do for other people is what i would refer to as esoteric tests <laughs> So, Robin, I'll bet most people um, quickly think that the clinical microbiology staff interacts just with the infectious disease docs. But in our world today with um, transplants and other complex surgeries, I'm guessing you all provide services um, across every medical discipline. Is that right? Absolutely. You know, um, patients across sort of all aspects of medicine uh, can have infections uh, from very common types of infections, such as urinary tract infections, to very complex infections, such as those that occur in transplant recipients. And so the people who send tests to the lab include not just infectious disease docs, but really almost any doc. I mean, maybe we can think about psychiatrists as maybe not having such a great need for microbiology tests, but but even they mm. may have, you know, the Wait, wait till the microbiome them. tells them that it's it <laughs> yeah. a great deal. Toxoplasma is changing their behavior. <laughs> okay. But but the point being that that um, really uh, are the people who order our tests come from all areas, and they include not just doctors uh, today, but nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and and so forth. Um, so yes, uh, we really touch a lot of uh, different um, types of healthcare practitioners. And Robin is a veteran of sort of TWIM. She was on ICAC <laughs> Live about uh, I think two years ago or maybe now three years ago in 2014, when you appeared with me along with your medical student, Vitas, uh, and I always screw up his last name, Karelis? Karelius, yes. Karelius, where they, and here is a medical student, and at my institution, medical students rarely get into the lab, and here this medical student got into the lab and was researching an outbreak of Bordetella paraportussis which caused the same symptoms as normal Bordetella or whooping cough. And he worked up this peripatussis. Uh, I guess it was a mini outbreak that was in Minnesota and northern Wisconsin, if I'm remembering right. You're remembering right. And actually his um, work is uh, in the process of being published now. Uh, But I will point out, um, it is awesome that he did that. And we have really great medical students. I'm actually on the second to last day of our microbiology class for our medical students here. They're wonderful, and I really enjoy teaching them. But the finding that led to the study that he did actually came from one of our laboratory technologists. I don't know if you remember that part of the story. I do, I do and that's why I sort of set you up. Since ah, we're, ah. Since we're a National Medical Laboratory Professionals Week, I thought this would give you an opportunity to plug your hardworking folks in the lab. Yeah. So let me tell you that story because I I think it's fascinating. So I told you that we have um, 271 allied health staff members, uh, most of whom are laboratory technologists, and um, they run our tests every day, day in, day out. We're a laboratory that is open 24-7. But they also um, help us develop our tests, and I can talk more about that. And they help us make sure that the testing that we are doing is of the highest quality. So we have a lot of quality systems in place to monitor the performance of our tests. And as I mentioned previously, many of the tests that we perform here are actually developed uh, in-house. So we have additional levels of quality that surround those, those tests. 
One of the things that we do with our molecular assays, our PCR amplification-based assays, and, and really all of our assays, is that we monitor percent positivity. It's one of many quality metrics that we use to ensure that our assays are working properly. And there's a group of people called our quality specialists here. These are a laboratory technologists that really specialize in maintaining the quality of the laboratory. It's all of our responsibility, but they kind of track and document uh, many of the processes we have in place. Honestly, and this is a big shout out to them, I think a lot of what they do is fairly boring, but the folks that do it are so committed to quality and it really maintains the highest level of excellence in the testing that we do. But this part isn't very boring. So they were monitoring the performance of our Bordetella paraprotesis assay and noted uh, that we had an uptick in the number of positive cases. Of course, our immediate response was, you know, do we have a problem with the testing? Are we having some problem with contamination and so forth? We investigated all of that and determined that wasn't the case. And that observation actually led to finding that we had an outbreak of Bordetella paraprotesis going on, not a problem with our assay, but it's it's really fascinating. And, and they've also done a similar um, type of tracking around our Bordetella pertussis, which is more of the classic cause of whooping cough data, and shown that the rates of positivity go up seasonally. And I don't know if you can guess the season in which we see the most positive cases of Bordetella pertussis. So I'll throw that back to you for a minute. I'd what do you say think? the winter. The winter? Yeah, that's what you would think. Mm -hmm. But it's actually the summer. So, Ooh. Yes. And, and we didn't believe that for a long time. But because we do so many tests and we're able to monitor this year after year, and it was important for us to know what the seasonal patterns look like to understand if our assay was performing properly, these folks really track that and show that it was the summer. And we actually wrote it up and published that because we thought that people wouldn't necessarily know that, just like you when I asked you, and I realize you're not an expert um, right. in pertussis, but it, it doesn't seem intuitive. Mm. So anyway, the work they do is amazing to me. They keep our assays working day to day. They make sure, you know, when we're testing patients, we've got to get it right. Uh, we don't have room for errors and um, they do an amazing job. So Robin, what, what is your role? You're, you're an overseer, I presume. You don't typically go in and look at results and try and sort out what's going on. You leave that to them. Yeah, so the challenge, right? We do over 3 million tests a year. So obviously I don't oversee <laughs> each and every one of those tests. I feel like I work really hard, but I think that would be virtually impossible. Um, so you're right. We um, operate a very standardized practice uh, where we help set um, the guidelines, write the standard operating procedures, review them, update them, make sure we're following all regulatory guidelines and so forth uh, for our staff. And then they train to our procedures and uh, perform them in the laboratory. However, um, there are times when we need, need to make changes. There mm -hmm. are times when there are problems with the test. There are unusual results. And there are some assays that I actually do personally oversee. Some of the more complicated uh, sequencing-based assays, uh, some of the sort of things that we're in the process of launching and I want to keep a very close eye on, uh, make sure that they're really performing the way we expect them to perform as we go live with them. I will be quite involved in uh, some of those. So it kind of varies, but you're, the average test that's performed is not personally performed by the laboratory director. It's done by the laboratory technologists and that's who we're really recognizing with Medical Laboratory mm -hmm. Professionals Week um, starting April 23rd. Okay. With, with 3 million tests a year, you must have a lot of um, tests that are now um, automated. You must have a lot of machines that can do high throughput. Is that We do. Okay. Uh, we have some pretty amazing automation uh, here, uh, robotics that are used. And I have to say that it's very important for our technologists to be properly trained and um, to uh, for us to make sure they're competent in what they're doing at regular intervals. Uh, but at the same time, where we can use automation and robotics, that's very helpful. Um, it takes away the mundane tasks. It's... Um, 
more reliable to use a robot than a human for repetitive types of tasks. And also, uh, there are issues of ergonomics doing that many tests. You know, if you're pipetting all day long, every day in your job, you can risk injury. And so that's where automation can really be of great help. And um, it's changing our practice, but I, in many ways, I think it's making the job that laboratory technologists actually do uh, even more interesting because the the boring repetitive things are being moved uh, more to instrumentation and they're they're involved in more of the thinking aspects of what they're doing. Uh, actually, explain a little bit what uh, these are sea changes in the practice and what set of skills are required now. In the old days, you, you learn to read p- plates and, and had a very visual and olfactory sense of what you were doing. And those skills are by and large being superseded by the fact that machines are doing a lot of that work and you pu- push a button. So what the, the set of skills required to do the work in a clinical lab now seem to be vastly different from those that were required in my days. You want to comment on that? Absolutely. Um, they are definitely evolving because of uh, automation. Uh, some of the manual tasks that were done by the technologists in the past are no longer done by the technologists. Um, as far as um, olfactory training, you know, we really don't encourage that in clinical microbiology <laughs> because that can be dangerous. I just wanted to point that out to everyone out there. Um, but as far as visual recognition of colony morphology, you know, we're using proteomics as our go-to method for identification of bacterial colonies today. That's really standard in the field. However, there is still the uh, requirement that a technologist be able to uh, recognize colonies, differentiate when they're looking at different colony morphologies, and also recognize when a proteomic analysis might be giving a result that doesn't make sense based on what one is looking at with the colony morphology. So we still do require those same skills. But in addition, our technologists need to understand molecular diagnostics, um, not just PCR, but there are a variety of other molecular diagnostics, uh, analysis of sequences, uh, how to uh, ensure that sequence data is quality data, but also that how to do the analysis of that data, which as you know, I'm sure is, is fairly complex. So we're evolving, I would say, rather than, you know, just just um, going to uh, sort of uh, a more uh, a practice where we have machines that are doing um, our job. And and to me, that's actually making it more interesting and fun for our laboratory technologists. And in fact, I think what I've witnessed over the years is that the amount of critical thinking expected of the laboratory um professional has increased rather than decreased as a consequence of the introduction of robotics. I I would agree with that. It's a little bit harder to quantitate at times, but there is so much more technology that we're using that the laboratory technologist has to learn about different things, about different kinds of technologies, but has to be able to troubleshoot and recognize when um, something's happening that doesn't make sense, that needs to be investigated and so forth. We obviously have procedures for defining when that is, but as you know, you can't really anticipate every strange thing that's going to happen. So we really do rely on our laboratory professionals to be just that, to be laboratory professionals. So, Robin, recently you and I were part of a conversation with another clinical microbiologist who told me about it, a, really a scary trend, which is the looming deficit of trained professionals to work in clinical microbiology labs. I wonder if you could talk about that and also maybe talk about how people who might be interested, students, could um, get some experience and explore whether this is a great career path for them. Absolutely. So I think the first uh, sort of point is how does one become a a medical laboratory technologist? Um, Typically, one uh, has some sort of degree that qualifies one for a position as a laboratory technologist. And I'll have to tell you, Michelle, right out of the gate, that sometimes the regulations in different areas of the world and even in different states can vary. So Mm. I'm not going to pre- pretend to be an expert on what the requirements are in each individual area, and I'm just going to kind of give a broad overview of this. 
Ideally, the folks that are hired as laboratory technologists would actually have a degree in medical laboratory science or clinical laboratory science. And the way that that is attained is either to do a standard undergraduate degree plus a one-year degree in medical laboratory science or clinical laboratory science, or to do three years of an undergraduate degree and then an additional year, like in your last year of training in medical laboratory science or clinical laboratory science. And those Two examples are typically referred to as four plus one or three plus one, if that makes sense. I see. So Mm -hmm. the, the, the great thing about that, I think, is for the student who knows they may be interested in this field, if if they go through their undergraduate training and take the typical science degrees, I mean, for, for microbiology, maybe a microbiology degree or at the very least a biology degree and get chemistry. the right um, or chemistry, the right um, uh, clinical uh, uh, laboratory science type of training, they're ready to go and can be hired as a laboratory technologist and work in a, a lab and have a job, you know, as soon as they graduate, the day they graduate. Um, some programs will take individuals who have a bachelor's degree, say, in uh, microbiology, if we're talking about a microbiology laboratory or biology without specific training in medical laboratory science or clinical laboratory science. But that varies from institution to institution. And I believe um, it also is affected by state licensing. So it might vary uh, from state to state um, based on whatever regulatory uh, requirements there are. The point is, though, that there is a very clear and well-defined uh, training pathway to become a medical laboratory professional. I think, and I'm biased, I guess, but I think it's a great career where people can really apply their science right out of an undergraduate degree and have, you know, a career either for life or as a stepping stone to doing something else. And we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, so I, I think, uh, I hope that there are some younger individuals listening to this conversation or who are going to hear this and realize that this is an opportunity for them because I, I just think, I think it's a great career for, for uh, Plus, what are the numbers of need that the gap that, that we need to fill in the next decade? Do you remember? So there are some institutions that um, have basically open slots for Mm -hmm. uh, laboratory technologists that they're having difficulty filling. I have to say that I think it depends on the individual institution uh, Mm -hmm. because this isn't uh, an across the board uh, need at every institution, uh, but certainly it is at many. And it Personally, it's really surprising to me that this situation exists because we have so many uh, individuals who are in undergraduate programs that are interested in science that want to apply their science and what better way to do it than to be a medical uh, laboratory technologist. I think there's maybe just an underappreciation of this field as a field uh, among we need a TV show. undergraduate students. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm. And, we need a TV know, show. This is really CSI with microbes. Right, we, exactly. We really need a, a good yes. television personality to take this on because some of the problems that you solve or your technologists solve in the lab that they bring to the director actually can change people's lives and actually change medicine. Absolutely. And, you know, I think not to um, single out nursing here, but people know what a nurse is from probably, you know, the age of two or something like that. Uh, But people don't really think about medical laboratory technologist as being a career opportunity where you can really make a difference by applying your science, uh, save lives, make diagnoses that really save people from getting more sick than they are, and so on and so forth. And there are so many opportunities beyond that. So, um, you know, an entry-level position right out of undergrad is what we're talking about. Um, And then 
one can stay in the field as a laboratory technologist. One can evolve um, and become more highly specialized as a laboratory technologist. One can go into administration and become an assistant supervisor, supervisor, and so forth in terms of laboratory uh, medicine and uh, healthcare administration. There's so many uh, possibilities even afterwards if someone wants to sort of evolve their career thereafter. But I, I agree with you. The folks that we have that come into our laboratory working as medical technologists, they're wonderful. They they make the lab work. But I, I believe that they also really, truly enjoy their career. It's a great career. Let me ask you a question that comes up from what uh, Michael just said about CSI. Do you see any possible overlaps or connections between clinical microbiology labs and forensic labs? I mean, you're doing some of the same things regarding DNA sequences. Do you think there could be a connection in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think the technologies that are used, um, some of the questions that are being asked are are very similar. I don't know why um, CSI is maybe so much more popular than microbiology. It's not for me. I mean, microbiology is where it's at. Um, but uh, yes, it's the same technologies. But but our patients are are alive, and you can save them. <laughs> sure. They're not dead. And <laughs> I I remember listening to Jack Gilbert. One of um, he's very active in researching strange places of the microbiome, and he recently did a workshop in Florida where he had two people break into a house and he then assessed the microbiome from the houses and was able to tell which burglar burgled a house because one of the particular burglars <laughs> was on a particular medication that altered their microbiome and they were able to forensically identify the burglar based on the microbiome that was left behind. So I think what we're going to see is as the forensic field of the microbiome gets more refined and more, more uh, accepted in the crime fighting world, we're going to begin to see the transference of the medical technologists from Robbins Labs to, to these crime labs and to begin to investigate all sorts of other questions. So from a perspective yeah, that's what of, I I was, I was thinking that way. It, it would really be a very interesting amplification of the um, job opportunities and also the uh, the exchange of uh, techniques that I think can be done across these fields. Michael, I, we, Michael, I think you should uh, write a proposal for 12 episodes of a TV show and send it off to the networks. I think you'd be good at that. <laughs> uh, and, and then I'll know you when I'm rich and famous. Yeah, there's no with, problem. And fun, you could fund uh, some of these podcasts. I could, I, I could become a patron of TWIM. That's right. Yes. Robin, Robin, I'm curious. Uh, you, you have all these assays. Maybe at one time you actually did some of them, but I guess yes. nowadays you can't do them all anymore. Do you periodically go in and try and get familiar? Stay have, current? Stay current, yeah. Oh, you're talking about me personally performing the assays. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure how would you get to really understand them? I guess you could if even if you didn't do them. That's what I want you to comment on. Yeah. So, you know, unfortunately for so I'm a, a doctoral level laboratory director and and you're absolutely right. I don't spend my days sitting at the bench. I'm in the lab, uh, but not sitting at the bench, uh, running the assays. However, as I mentioned before, um, we have a big effort that goes on here uh, on test development. And um, I have two research and development technologists that work with me in the clinical laboratory to develop bacteriology tests. Each of our laboratory directors has uh, research and development technologists that work with them to develop tests. And, and so we work very closely together as a team to decide what kind of tests need to be developed and what approach we're going to take uh, to developing those tests, which is uh, not a trivial activity. And uh, so I, f I feel like I'm very involved in the technologies that we use and troubleshooting the technologies and so forth uh, by, by staying very involved in the uh, determining performance characteristics and assessing performance characteristics of our tests. That being said, I don't know everything. And uh, we really function as a team. 
Uh, no, I didn't mean that to sound the way it sounded, uh, but but we really function as a team. So we have people who have expertise within the laboratory in certain areas, many of whom are laboratory technologists, laboratory technologists who, as was mentioned previously, can can really look at a colony on a plate and tell you exactly what that is without doing a fancy proteomic analysis or molecular analysis. Laboratory technologists who know antimicrobial susceptibility testing up and down and know more about it probably than almost anyone else in the world. And so we we work together as a team to troubleshoot, to make sure our assays are performing properly and so forth. Uh, I wish I could be in the lab running, running tests, but there's just yeah, no sure, time sure. Uh, to do that. And I think that's no different than anyone in a research lab. I mean, right. most yeah. PIs aren't performing uh, the research in their lab 24-7. I mean, they're they're part of a team that's doing it. Yep. Michelle, you so, were going to say something. Yeah, Robin, you mentioned that your um, division has seven PhD-level directors. So can you tell us a bit about that path? If there is a PhD student who did a thesis in some area of microbiology and they found that what they were really good at was assay development and they wanted to do something more applied. Is there a path for them to go from their PhD into clinical microbiology? Yeah, so absolutely. So for our doctoral level folks, um, there are possibilities to become laboratory directors of clinical microbiology labs. And I'm just going to correct you a little bit or clarify that. Sure. We actually have a uh, seven doctoral level laboratory directors, uh, four of us have MDs and three mm-hmm. have PhDs. And there are different pathways actually for folks with PhDs and MDs, but they both lead to the same um, position at, at the end of it. So for PhDs, so with so, for someone who has presumably a degree somewhat related to the microbial sciences, let's say in microbiology, but I mean, it could be in something related, maybe immunology or something like that. If they're interested in becoming a clinical microbiology lab director, then the pathway to do that is to apply to a fellowship program that provides training in clinical microbiology. The um, American Board of Medical Microbiology uh, has uh, accredited training programs throughout the United States. It's a two-year training uh, program. We have one here at Mayo Clinic uh, where you learn how to be a clinical microbiology laboratory director. That's a little different than just developing tests. You, You learn how to run and operate a laboratory. You also learn about the actual tests that are done in the laboratory. You learn a lot about management, and then you learn something about test development as well. And there's a board exam that um, has to be passed to be accredited at the end of all of that, that again is administered through the American Board of Medical Microbiology. So when you see the term ABMM after uh, folks' names, that's what that means. For MDs, the pathway is a little different. Typically, Uh, MD who's directing a microbiology lab is either already trained in infectious diseases or pathology. There are some alternative pathways, but those are the main ones. And then does a fellowship like I did in clinical microbiology for a year that's accredited by the American Board of Pathology. Uh, It's a little bit different. Now, the content of the training program for an MD or a PhD uh, trainee who's learning to be a clinical microbiology laboratory director would be very similar. So we have actually both programs here. And at any one time, we're training two PhDs and one MD. They, they are training to learn the same things, but the accreditation pathway and the prior training is different into those two tracks. So a little bit confusing, um, but those are the options. And I think that clinical laboratory science, and it's not just in clinical microbiology, by the way, I assume the people listening to this are probably microbiologists, but for folks that are uh, maybe interested in clinical chemistry uh, and so forth, there are other uh, possibilities to train to be a laboratory director in those areas. I'm also really curious about the innovation side of it. I, I would love to hear a story, something that you're developing now or that your your team has recently developed that you're especially proud of. 
Sure. So I'm I'm going to tell you a story about an assay we just uh, launched last week. I wow. can only talk a little bit about what we found because we're actually in the process of writing it up since it was so fascinating. And it's kind of topical to some of the other pieces that we've touched upon because it's a broad range bacterial 16S ribosomal RNA gene PCR. The type of assay one might use for microbiome studies, but we're doing this on sterile source specimens that aren't supposed to have any bacteria in them. So we use it as a tool to look for ideally single bacteria that might be present in a specimen where we can't find them by culture and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we actually have, uh, we launched uh, this assay last week after actually a very prolonged period of test development to make sure this assay was working right and was designed in the you know, ideal fashion. It also involves multiple laboratory technologists because there's an upfront PCR. And then if that's positive, then there's sequencing and then there's the analysis of the sequence data. So it's it's complex and our laboratory technologists are doing this and we had to make sure that it was not only properly developed, but that our folks were trained to be able to do it. So we went live um, last week and with our first run of testing, we actually had two positives. And one of them was for an organism called Neisseria elongata, which um, is an unusual organism. You've probably not uh, heard of it before. Uh, And it was from a heart valve from a patient with endocarditis. And uh, the interesting thing about that is the patient had had blood cultures that yielded that same organism, which we actually also identified by sequencing. But the clinicians weren't quite sure that that organism would be a cause of endocarditis because it's not really something that comes up kind of on the top 10 list of endocarditis cases. And so they they were questioning that diagnosis. And when the patient had their heart valve resected, not to make the diagnosis, but because they needed their heart valve resected, they sent it to us and we ran our broad range bacterial 16S ribosomal RNA gene PCR and it was Neisseria elongata. At the same so what's time- the, what's the natural niche of that particular organism? Uh, probably uh, oral, uh, but I actually don't know. It has been reported as a cause of endocarditis before, though it's not like it's okay. the first time. Yeah. So it all made sense, but I think that the testing that we did really helped. But on the same day, we had another specimen that had come to us, and um, it was from a patient from here that appeared to have lepromatous leprosy. Mm. Oh, my. Oh, yeah. So um, wow. they had done a skin biopsy, and it had shown acid fast bacilli. Uh, around the nerves, as would be expected for uh, leprosy. And so uh, arguably the test wasn't necessarily needed, uh, but out of interest, uh, we ran it. Um, we don't have a specific mycobacterium uh, lepri PCR. And very interestingly, we did not find mycobacterium lepri, but we did find mycobacterium lepromatosis. So that was fascinating. It's a My, cousin? Is that the kissing cousin? Yes. <laughs> yes, it's another species of uh, mycobacterium that has been uh, fairly recently associated with leprosy. So we're working on some more details. It was just discovered in 2008, but it was amazing to us to um, be able to make that kind of diagnosis with a, a broad range bacterial uh, PCR. It wasn't what we thought we would be diagnosing with our assay. So we're in the uh, process of describing that case. I don't want to talk too much about the details there, but we were just very excited. uh, How interesting. Finding, Yeah. So you never know what you're going to find. Robin, I think um, for the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I'd love to talk about some of your lab work. And, um, but before we do that, I want to remind everyone Uh, that the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education is now accepting submissions for a science-themed issue that explores evaluation and impact of various forms of science communication, understanding cognitive biases related to scientific topics, encouraging engagement in science-based dialogues, and much more. Uh, You can get involved in this issue. The deadline to submit is August 7th. You can meet the guest editor team and learn more 
at asmscience.org slash J-I-M dash B-E-E. That's asmscience.org slash J-I-M dash B-E-E. Now, Robin, you, in the last uh, number, couple of years or so, you've published a series of paper on an interesting condition caused by urea plasma parvum and urea plasma urealyticum uh, and hyperammonemia. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, This is another very fascinating story that has a few twists to it. I think it's a great story as well for this particular conversation because it actually started with uh, an observation that was made by a laboratory technologist. You probably don't know this part of it. If you read the publications, you wouldn't be able to figure out how how we got to this point. Um, But that's maybe the most interesting part of this. Um, It starts back in 2010 when one of our laboratory technologists, Valerie Zimmerman, came to me, and she had a culture of the tip of a catheter that was growing a very strange organism called Mycoplasma hominis. Mycoplasma uh, hominis is a member of the Molycutes. It doesn't uh, grow well on our conventional laboratory media. And as you might recall, these are organisms that don't have a cell wall. And so it didn't gram stain. In fact, it's really hard to see on culture plates. We were amazed she even found this. Uh, but her question to me as the laboratory director, so it sort of comes back to what does the laboratory director do, was what do I do with this? Mm. And uh, it wasn't something we would normally find from catheter tip cultures. Catheter tips, by the way, are intravascular catheters that get removed from patients where you can clip off the tip and then send it to the laboratory for culture. And basically it gets rolled on a plate and then we count colonies to look at whether the catheter might have been colonized with a particular organism, not typically, actually probably not ever, mycoplasma hominis. Uh, but more ordinary bacteria like Staphylococcus aureus and so forth. And so what what did I do as a laboratory director? Well, I looked at what was going on with the patient from whom this was recovered. And the patient was a lung transplant patient who had actually died um, uh, after 16 days after transplantation of a condition called hyperammonemia syndrome. Now, I didn't tell you this part, Uh, before when I was telling you what I did. But for many years earlier on in my career, I worked as an infectious disease doctor. And I worked exclusively in transplant infectious diseases. So transplant patients were actually my area of expertise. But this patient didn't apparently have an infection. They had hyperammonemia syndrome, meaning they had very high levels of ammonia that killed them. Now, in medicine, when patients have high levels of ammonia, we think about underlying liver disease or we think about inborn errors of metabolism that result in high levels of ammonia. And I tried to figure out what on earth hyperammonemia syndrome was at the time and uh, uh, basically ended up learning a lot about this condition. It occurs in about 4% of lung transplant patients And it typically has an onset very early on after lung transplantation where these patients develop high levels of ammonia and they eventually often die. That's what this patient had. Now, so there was the temptation to associate mycoplasma hominis with this patient's hyperammonemia. But in in medicine, a single finding of an organism in a patient with an odd syndrome doesn't mean that organism is causing that syndrome, obviously. But still, it was it was tempting. And so there was some additional testing done on the patient for mycoplasma hominis using a PCR that was developed by one of our laboratory technologists uh, that was conveniently available to us at the time. Uh, and we detected mycoplasma hominis in their trachea, lung, small bowel, colon, and whole blood. But still, that doesn't necessarily prove that the organism actually caused hyperammonemia. But in the um, subsequent lung transplant patients with hyperammonemia syndrome that we would see after that case, we did look for mycoplasma hominis uh, just to see if we would also find it, and and we didn't. And so the study or the idea sort of you know faded away, and we left it at that. It was uh, kind of an interesting finding. Theoretically, it's possible that mycoplasma hominis could generate some ammonia through metabolism of arginine, 
but it didn't seem to be panning out based on anything that we were seeing clinically. So then we fast forward to uh, 2014, four years later. I was actually in the airport in Minneapolis, and I got a phone call from my friend and colleague at Northwestern University, Michael Eisen, uh, who is also on the ASM microbe program committee, by the way. Great guy. Anyway, his phone call to me was as follows. They had just started their lung transplant program at Northwestern University, and they had a patient with hyperammonemia syndrome, and they had heard that we had had this one patient from whom we had mycoplasma hominis uh, isolated a long time ago, and they wondered if their patient could be tested for mycoplasma hominis. And I explained to him that, well, it's true, there was that one patient, but since then we hadn't been able to recapitulate that finding, and I didn't think it was worthwhile to do the testing. But after some arm twisting, agreed to do the testing with our PCR assay. Uh, It was arranged by one of our clinical microbiology fellows, we've talked about the fellowship program, to have the specimen sent to us from that patient. And there is a related kind of group of organisms called the urea plasmas, urea plasma, urolyticum, and urea plasma parvum, for which we also have a PCR assay, also developed by one of our laboratory technologists. And sort of, um, well, unbeknownst to me, it was arranged that this patient's specimens would be tested for both mycoplasma hominis as well as urea plasma species. Now, ureoplasma species are really very interesting as far as ammonia production uh, goes because um, urease metabolizes uh, urea to carbon dioxide and ammonia. And what happened was that patient tested positive for ureoplasma, but not for mycoplasma hominis. So that was an interesting observation because it sort of biochemically made a little bit more sense that if an organism was going to be associated with hyperammonemia, it might be ureoplasma. But again, one case doesn't make um, for causality, obviously. Still, um, we subsequent to that looked at several patients who had hyperammonemia after lung transplant. Um, And in all of them, we found either ureoplasma urolyticum or ureoplasma parvum, either in their respiratory secretions or their blood or both. And um, initially, of course, before this was recognized, those patients all had died. But after this association was recognized, that we've had uh, several patients who we've been able to diagnose with urea plasma infection in the context of hyperammonemia and treat for urea plasma uh, prior to their dying, and they've lived and they're doing fine and doing well. Now, all of this, of course, is all speculation, right, as far as what's going on with causality here. But what we haven't talked about today is that I run a basic science research lab where we do animal model work. And so having observed this in the clinical microbiology laboratory, it was it became time to take it back to the research laboratory and take a look at what would happen if we established an immunocompromised uh, mouse model of ureoplasma infection and whether or not those animals would develop hyperammonemia. And so we and, did and just that. to connect the dots for the listeners, um, the lung transplant is significant because they obviously need to be immunosuppressed before they get the new organ so they don't reject it. So that's why you also immunosuppressed the mice? Correct, correct. Okay. The other thing, and we'll come back to that, is you're actually moving a lung, both right. lungs or one lung, depending on how it's done. Um, from one patient to another, and the lung is obviously open to the outside world. So it's a little different, right, than a kidney transplant patient and so forth. Ah, so that could be the route, the route of acquisition. Mm -hmm. But yes, we felt that um, the immunosuppression must be or was likely to be key in this. So um, we we actually looked at non-immunosuppressed mice as controls and immunosuppressed mice. I'm I'm just summarizing actually a fairly large amount of work. Um, But anyway, we developed an immunocompromised mouse model of ureoplasma infection of the lung. Um, We did not transplant lungs into our mice. Uh, But, and then we we had challenged them with both ureoplasma ureolyticum and ureoplasma parvum. There are two species of ureoplasma that cause infections in humans. And with both of them, we were able to demonstrate that we could recapitulate hyperammonemia in these animals. 
So we felt um, very good about uh, that. Cox postulate, postulates had been yes. fulfilled. <laughs> is Cox's postulates Cox. is correct, and so we were very, very excited about that. Um, the other question, though, Michelle, you ask is a very good one. Why lung transplant patients? What's going on here? They are immunocompromised, but so are a lot of other patients, um, especially in this day and age. Mm. Um, So the other question was really about why lung transplant patients in particular. And I mentioned that, you know, they have an allograph that's connected to the outside world, which is not great for transplantation, but what can you do? That's what lungs do. But um, I will make a long story short here. There is actually evidence from our studies and those of our collaborators at Northwestern University who were very important, I mean, extremely important in making this uh, discovery in the first place, and who have gone on to do additional work, as have we, in terms of what's going on here. And appears that this organism, a ureplasma, both ureplasma ureliticum and ureplasma parvum, are likely donor transmitted, are coming in with the donor Mm -hmm. lung, which is Mm. really interesting. And that's a common thing in transplantation in general, um, but hadn't been shown with these organisms previously. And then back to- So is now that organism part of characterizing the organ before transplant so you can treat the recipient? Or is it- Yes. Okay. So the standard practice here- is to uh, screen the donor organ for this organism. The um, screening is done with our PCR assay, which was developed by our laboratory technologists. And then if it's found to be positive, they're given prophylactic antibiotics. And the antibiotics have to be particular here, right? Because these organisms don't have cell walls. So, um, you know, you, you have particular uh, choices in terms of antibiotics that are used against them, not your beta-lactams, for example. Um, But yes, a a strategy is in place now because of these findings uh, to prevent this from happening. So it it was just a... Bedside to bench to bedside. That's lovely. That's what I called it. That's very interesting that you say that. (laughs) It's all because of one curious medical technologist. And that's right. And that's the part of the story. You can read these publications, right? And you can sort of follow the story from one to the other. But the piece that's not in there is how we tripped on this in the first place. And it was because of a very observant laboratory technologist. Mm. And so now the standard of care has changed for lung transplantation. Correct. Is urea plasma in a component of a healthy person's lung? No, it's it's not felt to be part of the normal lung microbiome. All right. So the, the, the donors had somehow acquired it, but they weren't showing any symptoms, right? Correct. As far as Correct. you know. Right. Correct. So, Robin, on your 2017, the Parvum paper, I see that you also had collaborators from China. How did that collaboration get started? So as I mentioned, I run a basic science research lab, and my lab has a long history of having trainees from all over the world come and work with us. And Chao Hui came from China, worked in my lab, and did this work, and that's that's how that happened. Got it. So, Robin, you you don't see urea plasma in any other immunosuppressed kind of patient. You don't see it in AIDS patients, for example. So the story gets a little bit more complex when we start. Uh, talking about uh, ureoplasma that way, ureoplasma, uh, ureoliticum, and ureoplasma parvum are part of the normal genitourinary tract flora in many people. Uh, they probably play a role in causes of some genitourinary tract diseases, but they can also be just normal flora. Okay. So it's a complicated question that you ask. All right. So it's it's an environmental bacterium that can get into various places. Right. Yeah. And we are still in the process of trying to decipher exactly what's going on with urea plasma. Um, we're now back doing some biochemistry type of experiments with urea plasma, doing more animal work on treatment and prevention and so forth. All right. It's a great story. Love it. I don't know how you have time to do a lab and direct the la- the clinical labs, but you did say you were very busy. <laughs> Busy. This had to be done, though. You know, each 
each thing that we found along the way just was begging to be followed up on. And sure. um, I think it's made a difference for patients too, which is the the remarkable piece here. Absolutely. Great story. I love it. Uh, kind of wraps up our nice discussion about uh, clinical laboratory science and nice tribute for uh, next week's, I shouldn't say next week because this will be out next week, National Medical Laboratory Professionals Week. And that is TWIM number 150. You can find it at iTunes or at microbe.tv slash TWIM or asm.org slash TWIM. And uh, consider becoming a patron of TWIM and all the other shows we do, TWIV, TWIP, TWIVO. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. And we have a variety of ways you can help us out, Patreon, PayPal, and others as well. And we always love getting your questions and comments. Send them to TWIM at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. Well, just so much fun. Thank you, Robin. You're welcome. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for a great episode, Robin. It was fantastic. And you do all the medical laboratory scientists out there proud through through this episode. So I appreciate you coming on to him today. Thank you. Our guest, our guest has been from the Mayo Clinic, Robin Patel. Thank you so much for spending an hour with us, Robin. It was great. Great talking and thank you to all the medical laboratory technologists out there. You make a difference each and every day. Hear, hear. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Chris Kandine and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.